Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. So my name is Wardon Yomjinda and I am the Vice Chairperson of the Tokyo International E-Track Alumni Association. And today I am with Wichita Tira Tanabody or Whitney, my fellow Vice Chairperson. So today we are very excited um, to present you a very special webinar with our guest speaker, Professor Hugo Dobson. The webinar today is going to be about uh, global governance and Japan especially, the impact of the G7 and G20 um, on Japan's international relations. Um, so our guest speaker today, Professor Hugo Dobson, um, after receiving his PhD from the School of East Asian Study from the University of Sheffield in 1998. He became a research fellow at the International Center for Comparative Law and Politics at the University of Tokyo. Then he worked as a lecturer in the international relation of the international relations of East Asia at the University of Kent until 2000. After that, when he returned to the University of Sheffield, worked there as a lecturer, senior lecturer, professor, and finally as the head of the School of East Asian Study until 2019. And he is also one of the author of the textbook, Japan's National Relations, Politics, Economics, and Securities. So before I move any further, um, there are some housekeeping notes that we have to go over. Um, so as you can see for all the attendees in the chat room, when you look at the lower tab, you can see the Q&A bar. When you click there, you will be able to post a question if you have any to Professor Dobson. Um, please be informed that um, we will move into a Q&A session after Professor Dobson finished presenting his um, webinars. So that will be around 15 to 20 minutes from now. So if you have any questions, just post it there and we will make sure that it got answered after the presentations. Also, um, like to you to know that this lecture, this webinar is also being presented on Facebook Live and it is being recorded for the those who cannot make it to the live session. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand over the stage to Professor Dobson. Thank you very much. Great. Well, um, thank you very much and. Uh, Thanks to everyone for uh, inviting me and for organising this and um, also to everyone for uh, participating. Um, this is a bit of a new experience for me. I've been on the receiving end. Well, I've not been on the receiving end. I've been watching webinars, but um, this is the first time for me to give one via Zoom. So fingers crossed it all goes well. Um, I should probably also apologise looking at the slides that uh, began this presentation i've just realized that my appearance has suddenly changed as a result of uh, coronavirus i think i think as we're in lockdown all of us are going through a certain sort of uh, uh redefinition of our appearances so um apologies for the short hair and the beard and also apologies if i have i have two small children and if they barge into the uh, office in the middle of the talk then uh, i apologize profusely for that um let me try and get the technology up and going. I've got a PowerPoint that I'm going to share with you um, and hopefully this will all make sense. Um, well that's the end. Let's try again. Here we go. Super. So yeah what I'm going to talk about um, over the next 15-20 minutes uh, or so is um, a bit about global governance and what I've called a gaggle of genes. It's a phrase that I've sort of stolen from other scholars but what I'm talking about are these G groups, G7, G20, and the, there are many, many others. Um, and talk about Japan's role in these particular groups. I've got a couple of proposals as to the direction that particularly the G7 and the G20 might be going in. Um, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about how Japan has negotiated the shift from G7, which sort of symbolizes the previous world order, 
to a G20, which sort of symbolizes the new world order of developed and developing rising powers. Um, and I chose this image because I thought it was quite an quite a interesting uh, image capturing Japan's role in this. Um, as quite a famous image that came out of um, the uh, Canadian G7 in 2018. And there you've got Trump uh, facing off with Angela Merkel, but Japan, interestingly enough, uh, personified by Abe, playing the role of sort of the middleman between uh, America and Europe. But we'll come back to the role of Japan in a, in, in a bit. So let me first of all just explain what it is I'm talking about. First of all, I'm talking about a G7, a group of seven or a group of eight, as sometimes it will be called. Um, and just to explain a little bit of the history here, what are we talking about? We're talking about the top left hand corner on the slide, where a G6, the six countries of Britain, America, uh, West Germany as it was, France, uh, Japan and Italy came together in the Chateau of Rambouillet in Paris for the first time in 1975 in response to an economic crisis. Um, what has happened since that time is that we've had an annual summit every year um, running from 1975 all the way through to last year's summit which was 2019 again back in France in Biarritz in the south of France. Now the whole idea of this summit was initially that it would create an informal setting for the leaders to meet face to face to try and inject some political leadership uh, into facing some of the pressing issues, uh, largely macroeconomic issues in the 1970s. The whole idea was it was meant to be a fireside chat. The leaders wouldn't necessarily have an agenda, they wouldn't issue a communique, in the end they did issue a communique, but the idea was it would be kept informal as possible. Bureaucrats wouldn't be leading it, there would be no formalisation of the G7, it would be an informal fireside chat uh, amongst like-minded leaders. Now, over time, um, this has expanded. I mean, it was only ever meant to be uh, a one-year meeting in 1975, but they met the following year. Uh, they found that it was actually quite a useful mechanism. Um, new members joined. Canada joined in 1976. The EU joined in 1977. Uh, Russia joined in 1998, although its membership was suspended in 2014 because of uh, invasion of the Crimea. Um, its agenda has adapted and changed. It started looking at macroeconomic issues. It then started to deal with security issues in the Second World War, then on to um, uh, aid uh, in the African continent and climate change. Um, so it is, it's, it's, it's evolved over time and um, it's evolved in terms of its membership, in terms of its agenda, um, and it's still going. People have often said, well, the G7, why does it meet? What role does it play? Well, um, it still continues to meet because the leaders find some kind of value in it. Now, just to um, stress what kind of role, um, hang on a second, what kind of role the G7 plays, what kind of um, forum it actually is. Those of you who've studied European history might well um, have come across this, the Concert of Europe. This was essentially the collection of great powers that redrew the map of Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. So they were all great powers who recognised each other as great powers. Um, they met when was necessary to address issues that arose, um, crises that might have uh, developed. Um, and they expanded their membership. France was eventually included uh, within the Concert of Europe. Um, but it was informal. It was the personal encounter of these great powers um, and it was an informal gathering. Interesting aspect, one of the many people who claim to have created the G7 um, is also one of the people who wrote his PhD thesis on the Concert of Europe, Henry Kissinger. And people often talk about the um, impact of academic research. Um, so, well, this is a very good example of how Henry Kissinger's PhD on the Concert of Europe actually was realised with the creation of the G7 in 1975. 
However, more recently, we're not talking about a G7 so much. We're talking about a G20, um, especially since 2008. Now, in 2008, the G8, as it was before Russia's membership was suspended, was seen to have failed in dealing with the um, financial economic crisis that uh, emerged that year. When the G8 met in Japan at the Toyako summit in Hokkaido in 2008, they didn't even talk about the economic situation. A few months later, um, we have Lehman Brothers collapsing, uh, we have global financial crisis, and the G8 is largely seen to have failed uh, by that point. And also it's largely regarded as irrelevant. We don't have countries like China um, within the, uh, the forum. Uh, there's a number of rising powers which are excluded. So how relevant is it? Um, these kind of questions are being asked. So in response to the global financial crisis, what happens in uh, November of 2008 is that a meeting of finance ministers amongst the G20 is upgraded to the leaders level. Um, and this brings together the G7 alongside the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, um, a group of middle powers sometimes lumped together as the MICTA countries, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, Australia, plus Argentina, uh, and plus Saudi Arabia, and plus the EU. Now, very similar in nature to the G20, sorry, to the G7, the emphasis is in informality. The, you know, the G20 doesn't have an office, it doesn't have a formal structure, it doesn't have a constitution like the United Nations. This is an informal gathering of like-minded, well, not so like-minded in the case of the G20, because it's quite diverse, but this is a group of leading powers who are brought together to try and represent a crisis, uh, to try and address a crisis, sorry. Um, in terms of how the G20 is often seen as replacing the G7, statistics are often cited to bear this out. So, for example, um, the G7 represents 10% of the world's population, making decisions that affects everybody across the globe, but it only represents 10% of the world population. Uh, the G20 does better in this regard, it represents 65%. In world GDP, the G7 represents 40% of world GDP, the G20 represents 85% of global GDP. So by 2009, the G20 was able to declare itself as the premium forum for international economic cooperation. However, since that time, the G20 has gone through a similar process as the G7. Its role has expanded to include security, development, climate change, there are issues in the diversity of its membership. Um, there's also been the rise of the Trump administration, causing divisions within the grouping. And what we saw at the Hamburg summit in 2017 was a G19 plus one, with America going its own way over issues like climate change. It's also become unclear what the G20 actually is. It functioned very effectively as a crisis committee in 2008-2009, um, but it hasn't really evolved into a global steering committee that replaces the G7. And also the G20 has its own issues with that, about representation, the kind of issues that the G7 had. So, you know, uh, Professor Dobson, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We have uh, one of the attendees told us that um, they could not see your sharing slides. Oh, okay, let me try again. Let me share. Um, let me try again. Sorry about this. This is inevitable, isn't it? No, it's fine. This better? Technical, technical. Yes, now we see the slide, the group of 20, 2008 to 2019. Yeah. That's perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Sorry, apologies about that. As I said, this is the first time. Um, yeah, so the G20 has its own issues with um, um, legitimacy and representation. It only has 19 countries and one intergovernmental organisation in the form of the uh, EU. What about all the other countries in the world who's, who are affected by the decisions that the G20 uh, makes? Um, so one of the issues that we've seen is this gaggle of Gs, as I refer to in the title. 
Um, the G20 has risen, it's had its issues, the G7 has continued to meet, and what we have is called a messy multilateralism, a gaggle of Gs, this rather noisy collection of Gs where it's not clear what each group is doing, how it relates to each other, um, and it creates a very complicated situation. Now, I tried to capture that in the form of this uh, Venn diagram. Everybody likes a Venn diagram. Now, I failed, I miserably failed, but it hopefully gives you a sense of the complication that's going on here. Now, some people have said that there's a G0. There's actually, there's, a, there's no global leadership taking place. Um, some people have suggested that there's a G2, and that's China and America. Now, it doesn't obviously doesn't formally exist, but if we think of a G2 at the center, then we've got America on the one hand, which overlaps with the G7. We also have China, which is part of this BRICS group, which met as a G5. We've had a suggestion of a G14 at one point. Um, that was uh, a suggestion made by the French at one point, especially in the Arab Spring, where we were gonna have a G8 plus Brazil, India, China, South Africa, Mexico and Egypt. We've had a G16 proposed by Japan, um, which would include the G8 plus Australia, South Korea, Indonesia, and some other rising powers specifically to deal with climate change. We've then got a G20. Um, and then at the biggest level, you've got G194, which would represent all the countries in the world. Um, um, why don't we have that kind of organization? But we've got the United Nations, obviously. So it's created this very, very messy multilateralism. To try and provide a bit of clarity for the G7 and G20, I'm gonna make two quick suggestions of what they might do in the future, and then we'll talk about Japan. Um, as regards to the G7, the argument uh, I would make is based on an article that um, I was one of the co-authors of called How Informality Can Address Emerging Issues Making the Most of the G7. Um, you can download this from the Global Policy webpage. But what we basically did in this article was try to map all the various international organizations on two axes. One is how formal they are or, or how informal they are. And the other one is how diverse they are in membership or how like-minded they are. Now what's unique about the G7 is that it's a very like-minded group, at least it was until the Trump administration, um, but the Trump administration will pass and the G7 still has a higher degree of shared values than say a group like the G20 where you've got um, European, West European countries sitting down with Saudi Arabia, sitting down with Indonesia, sitting down with Argentina, a very wide, diverse group of countries. Now, as I say, the G7's uh, unique characteristic is that it's very like-minded and it's informal. And we suggest that what the G7 can do is it can leverage those qualities to address unprecedented, new, highly disruptive issues that characterize our complex world. Where we have well understood international problems that fit into existing categories, then the G7 shouldn't attempt to try and do the work of those organizations for it. So for example, we've got the Paris Agreement on climate change, diverse membership but there's a formal mechanism, a formal home for that issue to be dealt with. The G7 shouldn't try and address those kind of issues. Rather, it's nimble, it's flexible, it should try and deal with those emerging issues. Issues like artificial intelligence or cryptocurrencies, issues that don't really have a home yet. That's what the G7 can deal with effectively. As regards the G20, the suggestion I would make here is something I've made in a different um, publication on the Global Policy webpage, and that's to do with the role of Asia. One important aspect of the G20 was that it expanded Asian membership from previously Japan being the only Asian member of the G7. Now we have what some people have suggested could be an emerging Asian six, and that would be Japan supplemented by South Korea, Indonesia, India, China, and controversial for some, but Australia would be, um, and certainly regard itself as an Asian country. Now, what has been argued is that um, these countries could caucus ahead of G20 summits, um, hammer out an Asian position and go to the summit with a much, much clearer Asian uh, agenda that's going to be fed into G20 summits. 
Now, this has not really happened so far. Instead, these countries have had very divergent agendas. They've often been competing um, over the same role within the G20. They all want to be an Asian representative or they all want to represent rising powers and developing powers. But recent developments have demonstrated that these countries could possibly have a more coherent role to play with each other. So if you look at the 2017 Hamburg G20 summit, you had on the first day, well, the day before the summit began, rather, you had the Korean President Moon Jae-in meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping um, for a bilateral meeting to talk about North Korea. You also had the next day, Prime Minister Abe meeting with um, President Moon as well for the first day of the summit, stressing the future oriented nature of the relationship and on the last day of the summit you had Xi and Abe meeting on the morning of the last day to talk about a whole range of issues including um, official visits that would take place uh, thereafter. Now build that up from bilateral meetings you've got some kind of sort of emerging trilateral uh, negotiate uh, discussion taking place amongst these three leading northeastern Northeast Asian powers. So you could see an A3 possibly emerging, and that, that could be expanded to an A6. Now, what this would require would be some kind of formal structure. And one thing I've suggested is that the Trilateral Cooperation Secretariat that was set up in 2011, the only intergovernmental organization to bring together Japan, South Korea, uh, and China, could possibly play the role of Secretariat of an emerging Asian three at the very least. So they're my two suggestions for the G7 and the G20. What about Japan's role within this? Um, Japan's response to this gaggle of Gs, I suppose in some ways has been built around four elements and partly map across three different timescales. So I think on the one hand, bilateralism, and those of you who've read the textbook that we wrote together, Japan's International Relations, will have see that we talk about these norms, if you like, as shaping Japan's international relations. So bilateralism, Japan has always put a strong emphasis upon bilateralism, especially its relationship with the US. And that is true within the G7. Japan always had one eye on the relationship with America, and that hasn't changed with the rise of the G20. Bilateralism is still hugely important to Japan's international role, Japan's role in global governance, and Japan's role in these um, G groups. Asianism is something that's changed slightly. Japan's traditional role in the G7 and partly what defined its role was it was the appointed represent self-appointed representative of Asia. It brought Asian issues to what was largely a European and North American grouping. Um, whenever the Japan was actually acting as the host of the summit, it always made sure that there was an Asian um, element to the agenda. With the rise of the G20, Japan has struggled to play this role. Um, the inclusion of other Asian countries have created other rivals, and Japan was seen to have lost out to these rivals, especially in 2010, when South Korea hosted the first Asian G20, but also in 2016, when China secured the role of president and host of the uh, G20 summit that year. So this has been, quite a difficult transition for Japan. Internationalism, we're talking about Japan's desire to be seen as a good global citizen and this translates itself into global summitry because Japan is always trying to host successful summits. It doesn't want to be held responsible for a failed summit. Um, this shaped Japan's role within the G7. It always wanted to ensure that the G7 was successful um, and also that it hosted successful summits. But with the rise of the G20, Japan's been put in a slightly difficult position because it prioritizes its role as a G7 country. The G7 gives it that identity as the only Asian representative. So it wants the G7 to continue. It wants the G20 to succeed, but it doesn't want it to succeed so much that it replaces the G7 permanently. So it's had a sort of its hands have been tied slightly within the G20 for a number of years. Um, however, I mentioned finally a potential Abe doctrine emerging, and this is something that's given a bit of clarity to Japan's role within uh, the G7 and the G20. 
Some people like my colleague Christopher Hughes at the University of Warwick have argued that what we're seeing is an emerging Abe doctrine uh, to replace the Yoshida doctrine. So rather than this low profile foreign policy position of Japan, we're seeing Japan emerging in a much more proactive role. And this is characterized by, first of all, Japan trying to arrest its decline and secure its status as a great power. Secondly, overcome any perceived shackles that have hampered Japan's role to play a proactive role in the world. Thirdly, historical revisionism is an important part of Abe's uh, foreign policy, um, but that brings in a domestic element. And fourthly, um, Abenomics. Japan can't do any of these things. It can't secure its position as a great power um, without being economically strong. So these are the four characteristics that make Japan a more proactive player under Prime Minister Abe. Now, I think if you look at Japan's response since 2008 to the present time, response to the gaggle of Gs, you'll see three periods. First of all, you see this confusion, especially under the DPJ, um, who assumed power um, and were possibly not very clear as to what kind of foreign policy they were trying to pursue. In the case of the G7 and the G20, this is very clear, um, the confusion. Japan was trying to struggle with the loss of its Asian leadership role. It was also trying to support the G20, but it didn't, as I say, didn't want it to be too successful, that it replaced the G7, which gives Japan's great power status and this sort of special protected status as a great power. So you had this period of confusion. Then in 2012, you sort of have um, Consistency. Abe returns to power. Um, you see the Abe doctrine starting to emerge. Japan is being more clear in what it's trying to achieve within these gaggle of Gs, but often that comes at the expense of internationalism. It's Japan trying to promote Abenomics internationally, it's trying to promote its status as a great power, it's trying to say it's making a proactive contribution to peace and so on, but it often tends to be the internationalist aspect of Japan that suffers. Now, I think we're into a third period now because last year Japan got the opportunity to host its first G20 summit. Um, and what you saw under Abe was a much greater commitment to the G20. Uh, he wanted to ensure that uh, Osaka was seen as a success. He was willing to, um, well, he was keen to avoid America walking away and a G19 plus one emerging. He tried to keep Trump on board as much as possible. So there is a greater commitment and it was a relatively successful summit in Osaka last year in a number of ways. So I think I've spoken probably for long enough and we really need time for Q&A. So I think I'll stop there. Um, but very much thank you for listening to what I have to say. Uh, my contact details are here. Do feel free to contact me um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, professors. Um, um, so if the viewers and the participants, want, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to use the Q&A tab on the lower bar and enter the, any questions or inquiries that you might have over there. We did have a question submitted ahead of the um, uh, webinar. Um, and maybe if I sort of pick that one up, it will give people a chance to sort of think of some questions. Um, there, was, there was a very interesting question uh, someone submitted asking what exactly the G7 and the G20's response is going to be to the current pandemic. Um, I think my response to that would be um, the headlines have been very, very negative in many ways. The G7 was um, sort of sidelined. Um, one of the main stories that emerged was that they were unable to agree on a common position because uh, America was insisting on referring to coronavirus as the Wuhan disease. Um, so they didn't seem like the G7 was going to play a particularly strong role. Um, the G20, um, similarly, there have been a number of um, web, well, online meetings taking place amongst the G20 leaders, um, but they didn't 
come out with such a strong and immediate response as they did in 2008, 2009, when they were dealing with the global financial crisis. And people have been wondering why the G20 has not been able to respond to a crisis in the same way it did in 2008, 2009, because that, that's what it excelled at, it was a, it was a crisis committee. Um, I think one thing I would say is that those are the headlines. There are things going on in the background. Um, just to give you one example um, that I'm personally involved with, there are engagement groups that interact with the G7 and the G20 um, that represent certain groups. So, for example, the one I'm involved with um, with the G7 and the G20 is called the T7 and the T20, the Think7 and the Think20. Um, and this is a collection of university-based um, scholars, scholars working in think tanks, who develop recommendations that feed up, hopefully, to the G7 and the G20 leaders. Um, there's a number of other engagement groups representing civil society, representing the business world, who are doing the same thing. Now, these groups are meeting, they're making suggestions, they're building a statement, a platform, which will be fed up to the leaders' level. Um, so the G7 summit will take place this year um, online in June. Um, it does have the challenge that America is hosting the G7 this year, but there are processes in place whereby evidence-based suggestions should be emerging uh, in what the G7 says. So I wouldn't write them off just yet. Similarly, the G20, one challenge it has is that Saudi Arabia is chairing the G20 this year um, and is maybe not as experienced um, as other hosts may be. But again, there are processes in place to ensure that sensible evidence-based suggestions and recommendations will emerge uh, for the leader's agenda. So I think, you know, this is to be continued. I would keep your eye out and see what happens with these groups. One recommendation I would make is and I have made uh, elsewhere, is that I think the G20 will probably benefit from some kind of formalization to create some kind of secretariat, which could be very light touch, um, but give it some kind of leadership. And, you know, go back to the history of the G20. Gordon Brown, a former UK prime minister, was a very successful leader of the G20 in 2009 when the G20 met in London. Um, I think he's probably looking for a job and he could possibly be a potential uh, good choice as Secretary General of a G20 if it was to formalise a little bit. All right, thank you very much, Professor Dobson. Um, I actually have my own question, actually. Is, um, like, considering like all this gaggle of the Gs, like, do you think the departure of Russia following in 2014 has been a good thing for the G7 group? Considering that now all the countries are more allied, like politically at least they are liberal democracies? Mm. Um, I, I would completely agree with you. I think, um, and I did sort of write about this um, in a few blogs at the time, but this is something that the Japanese government was warning about in the 1990s. You know, the G7 went through this long process during the, that decade of wooing, if you like, Russia. Um, so Gorbachev was sent a letter to the G7 when they met in London at the beginning of the decade. Then Russia was a guest. Then it became more formalized by 1997. The Denver summit, they couldn't call it a G8 because Japan was still objecting to that, so they called it a summit of the eight. And the following year in Birmingham in the UK, it was actually a G8. But all this time, Japan was warning, including Russia, will unravel the shared values that we have as self-recognized, mutually recognized great powers of the day. And that was true. Japan was proved right in the process. Russia didn't contribute a huge amount to the G8 as it was. It has some of the lowest levels of compliance with G8 recommendations and G8 commitments. Um, 
it certainly created a much more coherent, like-minded group for the G7. So in many ways, I would say that Russia's departure, its membership has only been suspended. It's not been ejected from the G7. There's still a road back for, for Russia. But I don't think Russia's particularly interested in joining this group that it would regard as you know, largely irrelevant. Um, but I think that's a good thing for the G7 and its like-mindedness. Thank you very much. And on that note, when we are talking about a more of an authoritarian regime, when it comes to G20, obviously the leader of Asia right now could argue it is China. And when you have a nation with such a different well compared to other liberal democracies, wouldn't just simple bilateral meetings be better compared to um, having a big meeting like a G20s, right? When I mean, you have talk about um, when there is a meeting, not only it's just bilateral between China and other nation, and they are the one dictating where the dis discussion would go. Consider their economic power. Mm. No, I mean that, that's that's a very good point, and that is one of the weaknesses of of the G20 is that it is such a diverse grouping. Um, you know, if they you can. If they're going to address certain issues, you have to ask why are certain countries at the table? Do they actually have anything to contribute to a debate around um, aid to Africa, for example? Um, now, some people have suggested that what we need is a sort of variable geometry, but depending on the issue, that dictates who's around the table. Um, and you have the most important stakeholders um, at that time. And that, could be something that would be very difficult to organize but it could be something that um, might emerge in the future it would only make this gaggle of g's even more confusing but i mean one thing the g20 did do was that it showed in its early years in 2008 and 2009 it showed that it had the right countries around the table to address a particular crisis um, and that has been you know the success story the headline for the g20 it has found it difficult to replicate that kind of success, especially with coronavirus. But this goes back to my previous answer. Coronavirus is a very different issue from the global financial crisis. I don't think the G20 is necessarily the right country to be dealing with uh, coronavirus. Um, so, yes, one point you raise. Well, so what I would say is that having all those countries around the table can be powerful if it's the right issue and the right time. One thing about these summits is they're not just about the multilateral meetings. They're also about those bilateral meetings are a hugely important part of what happens at a summit. Um, so we shouldn't keep a, take our eye off what happens with those kind of bilateral conversations, whether it's Obama and Putin meeting on the edge of the G20 summit in Turkey to talk about the situation in Syria, or whether it's the three East Asian Northeast Asian countries meeting on the edges of the Hamburg summit. These are hugely important parts of what happens within a summit. Um, it's the bilaterals, it's the multilateral meetings, it's the stakeholder groups like the T20 and all the civil society groups. This almost creates a kind of sort of circus, if you like, of what G20 summits can be. Thank you. And considering the next G meeting is going to be virtually online perhaps like how is this going to impact the event now that the leaders no longer have a face-to-face -face term to maybe help yeah that's that's why i'm really interested in seeing how this works um i mean as i've demonstrated very clearly technology isn't necessarily your friend and so you can have mistakes happen um but also the fact that these groups, as I said, their defining characteristic is their informality. They're all based around their personal encounter, sitting down face to face with these people, getting a feel for what your fellow leaders are like, building up those interpersonal relationships. This is going to be very difficult to do this online. Um, so I'm going to be interested to see how that actually works uh, in reality. It might be that the summits become much more of a pre-planned, pre-rehearsed, uh, pre-drafted, di bureaucratic, diplomatic exercise, rather than what they were meant to be, which is this informal fireside chat amongst leaders.
Perfect. Um, so we almost ran out of time. Actually, we are a couple of minutes over, actually. So for the attendees, if you have any questions, you it is your last chance to ask question to Professor Dobson. You can also use the features. This is a, on the lower tab, there's a raise hand button that you can click and then we can um, have you talk directly to the professor and ask him question. Or you can also type it um, down there, there. All right. Whitney, do you have any question for Professor Dobson? For me, everything has been quite clear. And yeah, we've touched upon quite a few things that I was wondering about. So for me, I'm good. Thank you. All right, then. Um, if there are no further questions about the G7 and G20s, then on behalf of the Tokyo International um, E-Track Alumni Association, I would really want to give a special thank you to Professor Dobson for um, joining us and giving our alumni and students in our, um, in our um, GIU sphere an opportunity to learn about this really interesting topic today especially considering the situation and the pandemic that put us together to actually part of the reason why we organize our webinars. And I also want to give a thank you to all the attendees today. Um, the recording of this event will be available on our Facebook. Um, so if you want to catch up or if any of your friends are interested in, you can um, join our Facebook group or also our, we also have an Instagram and LinkedIn page for you to follow in case you have any question or any interest or interest in joining our future webinars which we will be organizing. The web the next one is going to be um, actually on Wednesday. Um, I think my internet might be a bit unstable. Can you hear me too? Please? Okay, uh, it's perfect. Oh, now thank, thank you everyone again for joining us. And again, thank you so much for Professor Dobson for you know, giving um, uh, the presentation for us. Oh, yeah, thank right. you. Thank Bye. you everyone. And please stay safe during the, yes, thank you. And please stay safe during this pandemic. And hopefully we see you again soon on one of May our many webinar sessions to come. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Cheerio.